ICCM presents Community Music as Ambiguous Musical Practice. Hello, I am Kim Buskov speaking to you from Copenhagen, Denmark, and I'm very honored to be part of this series at the ICCM on criticality in community music. So thank you to the ICCM team for inviting me. Just to let you know a little bit about me, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Danish School of Education at Aarhus University and a lecturer in music education at the Rhythmic Music Conservatory in Copenhagen. In 2019, I defended my PhD thesis at the Norwegian Academy of Music in Oslo. And this thesis is entitled Music and Social Transformation Exploring Ambiguous Musical Practice in a Palestinian Refugee Camp. So I am excited about sharing my ideas about this topic of criticality in community music with you. And what I will present to you here is some conceptual stuff to make us think about and question some of the assumptions underlying community music work. And I will refer to my own research on a community music program in a Palestinian refugee camp in order to illustrate some of my ideas. Community music as a field of scholarship is relatively new, but has experienced a rapid growth in terms of how many people around the globe that find meaning in and identify with this term. As community music has become a global phenomenon, it has also become increasingly clear that the notion of community music can be understood and practiced in a variety of ways as it intersects with and develops alongside local forms of participatory music making and understandings of music. Yet, as Bartlett and Higgins write in their introduction to the Oxford Handbook of Community Music, a central idea of community music in the 21st century is connected to the idea of intervention, how community music can be seen as an act of intervention between a facilitator and participants. As Higgins describes this, drawing on Homi Baba, as a form of thoughtful disruption, intervention denotes an encounter with newness a perspective that seeks to create situations in which new events innovate and interrupt the present toward moments of funeral transformation. Thus, the interventionist approach to community music emphasizes participatory music making as a means of social transformation. Community music is imagined to be a response to social problems of deprivation, marginalization and exclusion, a way of empowering participants to change aspects of their social worlds and to form new and better relationships to themselves, each other and their surrounding world. Yet as community music is connected to processes of positive social change, a need has arised for critical reflections on the underlying assumptions of community music practices. Too often, as Diana Yerichuk has pointed out, has the community in community music thinking been normalized as always already inclusive and thereby as an always and only good thing, thereby neglecting the potential problematic and excluding features of community. Another prominent critic of such tendencies to idealize music as a means of social change is Jeff Baker, who urges us to acknowledge that cultural practices potentially have both positive and negative effects simultaneously and claimed benefits may come with hidden costs or counter effects. My own work focuses on music as a means of social transformation and more specifically, it addresses the need to develop deeper understandings of such paradoxical and or conflictual processes in musical social work that Baker points to. I have developed a notion that I call ambiguous musical practice as an analytical lens suited to illuminate how musical practice may be entangled in transformative as well as socially reproductive processes and how such processes may be thoroughly intertwined. 
I will talk more about the notion of ambiguous musical practice in a bit, but first I wish to show you how this notion was developed as part of my research on a community music program in a Palestinian refugee camp in the southern part of Lebanon. My research connected to this program is based on an eight month stay in Lebanon in 2012, where I worked as a music teacher in this program and subsequent field work I did in 2016 and 18. So first a little bit about this particular context. Uh, the Palestinians in Lebanon are long-term refugees. They have been in the country since 1948 and to this day continue to live at the margins of society with a strained relationship to their Lebanese hosts and forgotten by the international community who barely pays attention to the longest running refugee crisis in the world. For many Palestinians, the permanent insecure situation understandably produces a longing for relief, which is found in dreams of returning to the lost homeland, also attained through dangerous attempts at leaving illegally for Europe. A music program was established in 2003 in the refugee camp Rashidi as a collaboration between a Palestinian NGO and Norwegian organizations and music educators. Today, this program provides music activities and dance training to between 40 and 80 children and youth from the refugee camp. The participants come to the social center of the Palestinian NGO two times a week to play both Palestinian and Arabic music and Norwegian or international folk and pop music. The participants receive group lessons on their instruments. They play in a big orchestra and also learn the Palestinian communal folk dance, Debke. A group of the older participants also performs Debke in a presentational form that often depicts either scenes from pre-1948 Palestine or thematize the suffering of the Palestinian people and the longing for return. Performances of music and dance are often staged in connection to Palestinian commemorations, which are events hosted by the Palestinian NGOs that mark the most important dates in recent Palestinian history. For example, every year on the 15th of May, the Palestinians commemorate the Nakba, which translates to the catastrophe, the day many Palestinians were expelled from their homeland due to the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. Commemorative events are important in Palestinian cultural and political life because they assert the unity of the Palestinian people and the continuous advancement of the central political claim of the Palestinian community, which is the right of return to Palestine. The music program also includes a cultural exchange program between Norwegians and Palestinian youth. Groups from Norway have visited the camp many times and groups of Palestinians have visited Norway and Norwegian friendship institutions and performed music and dance. These visits are very important for the Palestinians because they are signs of the mutual friendship and recognition that the Palestinians long for and a chance for the young Palestinians to experience the world outside the refugee camp. Due to the involvement of the Norwegian music educators, there's actually been quite a lot of research into the participants' experiences of this program, especially focusing on its positive social impact. Considering the program as a community of practice, Storsvi, Vespu and Ruud uh, state that the music program offers the participants a repertoire of roles which will partly challenge the limits they usually meet and which will open new possibilities and thus a hope about how to shape their own future. And in a study concerning the potential health benefits of the program, Ruud writes that the adolescents engaged in the program have experienced a markedly positive effect upon their sense of vitality, agency, and belonging, as well as their felt meaning and hope for the future. In other words, they have experienced positive health effects. Likewise, in one of my previous studies of the program's cultural exchange activities, where the Palestinians and Norwegian music students perform together, I write about how this intercultural collaboration allows for experiences of recognition and mutuality that challenge the Palestinians' prevailing feelings of neglect and marginalization. 
This study is a very exemplary of how community music research is often carried out based on participant observation and interviews with participants and facilitators aiming to understand how music making may have a positive impact for a marginalized group of people. So when I set out to do a more comprehensive study of this music program in 2015, my ambition was to gain a deeper understanding of how music works in this particular context and to explore the participants' experiences in the program, as well as the broader social, cultural, and political significance of the activities. And through this research, also to write about music as a means of social transformation. And during this research project, I became increasingly interested in the ambiguous functions that I found the music program to have for the participants. This ambiguity is connected to how music making in this context, on one hand, provides a foundation for social transformation in the way participants are enabled to create new understandings of themselves, their relationships within their social world and positive experiences of their cultural and national identity. In this way, participants are enabled to challenge the existing marginalizing structures that constrain the lives of the Palestinian refugees. And this way, my research has validated the previous findings in the studies I just mentioned. Yet, on the other hand, I show in my analysis how the music program establishes a specific frame for national belonging that tend to reduce the lived experience of the young Palestinians growing up in Lebanon to a particular nationalistic construct of primordial attachment to the land of Palestine. The music program in this way functions as a means of national education and by advancing a specific understanding of what it means to be Palestinian, it naturalizes and essentializes Palestinian identity. This means that other categories, dimensions and experiences that would allow the participants to come into social existence in different ways are downplayed or excluded. In this way, while music making may be a way for a young Palestinian of gaining resources for experiencing and negotiating his or her social and cultural identity, the social and institutional context that provides such resources may at the same time impose crucial limits and constraints to how such processes of self-discovery and self-creation may occur. The participants' experiences of meaning and hope for the future are bound to them being fashioned as Palestinians and subjected to socially sanctioned forms of national belonging. This means that even if participants are empowered to transform aspects of their social world, even if they are unable to inhabit new roles and gain new possibilities, such transformations rely on instances of authority and legitimacy that do not easily come into view and that are not questioned in the course of music making. These are social and institutional formations that underlie the musical practice and that uphold the social norms within which participants are able to act and to make sense of their experiences. In this way, social transformative processes seem to be intimately connected to social reproductive ones. So because of time limits, I will not go further into how the young Palestinians use music making as a means of aspiring to negotiating or challenging such social norms. But I encourage you to take a look at my PhD thesis, in which you will find some articles that deal specifically with this and the notion of agency that I work with. And maybe we can also touch upon this in the discussion later. Instead, I will use the time to present my attempt of developing an analytical framework attentive to such ambiguous processes that I hope might assist other practitioners and scholars in understanding these paradoxical processes of community music activity. I've called this notion ambiguous musical practice. The term ambiguous in this context is meant to denote a musical practice that has effects on many levels and that these effects can be seen as conflictual or bi-directional. Furthermore, the word ambiguous points to the in-betweenness or liminality of musical performance. This notion is connected to the anthropology of performance, commonly associated with the anthropologist Victor Turner. In this line of thinking, 
performance, including musical performance, is due to its ambiguous or liminal character, a space in which social relations can be experienced and transformed. I found this idea really helpful when trying to understand the transformative potential of music making. And in fact, I believe the idea of liminality has in many, in many ways, both consciously or unconsciously, come to form our understanding of how community music may work as a means of social transformation. I see many similarities about how the notion of liminality has come to shape understandings of the social function of cultural performance and rituals as Turner writes about, and how the prevalent notion of community music portrayed is, portrays it as an act of intervention, as an event that interrupts existing structures and social relations. For Turner, to be in liminality is to be betwixt and between, a place of desire, possibility, supposition, and play. And this way, also close to the way Higgins imagines community music interventions, as I quoted in the beginning, as events that innovate and interrupt the present toward moments of feudal transformation. Characteristic for the liminal condition in Turner's view is that it is an anti-structure that places itself in opposition to the established and institutionalized social structures. Brimmer, Hyham and Brown have written about how many music, uh, community music practitioners are attracted to this notion of the organic bottom-up people-focused other and non-institutional nature of community music activity. The leading self-conception in the field can this way be said to imagine community music as operating from outside or on the margins of the established, the authorized, the legitimate and dominant culture. It is from these cultural in interstices that community music is thought to intervene in existing frameworks and social relations from the space of liminality, the space in between. In this way, the idea of liminality can be said to, to be central in community music thinking. And Lee Higgins notion of co uh, the community musician as a boundary walker can be said to represent this self-conception as well. Yet such ideas are interesting also for what they leave out of consideration. And some of the critique that has been directed against Turner and his emphasis on liminality as a central notion by which to understand rituals and cultural performances can be extended to the field of community music as well. Pierre Bourdieu writes in an essay entitled Rights of Institution, how the theories of ritual associated with Turner place too much emphasis on the transformative function of ritual. Focusing on the liminal phase of ritual, attention is drawn to how the ritual enables the transcendence of a specific social boundary. For example, in a rite of passage that turns a boy into a man. But Jews' argument is that the most prominent social function of the rite is not the transformation that brings a boy into adulthood, Instead, it is to mark out a difference between those to whom the right pertains and those to whom it does not pertain, as Baudru writes. There is a hidden set of individuals, in this case the girls and women, not directly addressed by the ritual itself, but that nonetheless are defined by how the ritual consecrates a fundamental distinction between the sexes and thereby imposes and legitimizes an arbitrary boundary in the social order. So the ritual, in Bourdieu's view, fundamentally gains its, its transformative power by reproducing, reinforcing, and concealing an underlying institutional formation. And if you consider my analysis of the Palestinian music program, you can notice how, as the young Palestinians are unable to transform certain aspects of the social world through music making, they are also involved in reproducing and affirming specific categories and assumptions about Palestinian identity that must be seen as fundamental social formations underlying and empowering the musical practice itself. In my notion of ambiguous musical practice, I extend Bourdieu's critique by linking Turner's concept of performance to Judith Butler's notions of performativity and subjectivation. Whereas Turner emphasizes the transformative potential of performance, 
Butler's thinking provides us with a model of thinking about the normative function of performance. With Butler, we get a sense of how the very structures and norms that constrain us also are the ones we rely on for acquiring agency. While I maintain that musical performance entails some particular opportunities for agency and the transcendence of social boundaries, which with Turner we could ascribe to the liminality of musical performance, such opportunities for agency may be seen as forms of docile agency regulated by the social and institutional formations that underlie the musical practice. So it's not enough to look at how music making provide opportunities for changing social relationships at what we could call the immediate level of practice. Such transformations are connected to deeper levels of sociality, the social and institutional formations that underlie the musical practice. In order to establish a theoretical foundation for this idea, I have found the critical musicologist Georgina Bourne's model for the social mediation of music really helpful. According to Bourne, music can be seen to mediate the social or establish particular socialities on four planes or levels. First, in immediate performance or practice. Second, as imagined communities that transcend the immediacy of musical practice. On the third plane, music mediates and is mediated by the social identities of gender, sexuality, race, nationality, locality, etc. And finally, the fourth plane concerns the institutional formations in which music is produced. These different social planes constitute a musical assemblage and a thorough understanding of how music transforms social relationships must take all of these planes into consideration and also the paradoxical, ambivalent or conflictual social relations produced across these four planes of social mediation. So I draw on these different theoretical insights in the development of my notion of ambiguous musical practice created to allow for such complex and potentially conflictual social processes of community music practice to come into view. The notion consists of three interlocking dimensions. The first is bi-directionality, concerning how music making may at once lead to the destabilization and consolidation of social norms and relations. The second dimension is multiplicity of meanings concerning how music making produces multiple meanings and therefore also may produce contradictory social effects but on different levels of sociality. The third dimension is in-betweenness concerning how music making may place participants in, state, in a state in between understood as a social space where multiple identities, relations, and meanings can be both performed and imposed in ways that render them indeterminate. In this way, the notion of ambiguous musical practice constitutes an analytical framework that allows for dealing with the complex and paradoxical intersection of transformative and reproductive social processes of community music practice. It departs from common explorations of the positive impact of music making and insists on keeping an eye out for the more concealed functions of musical performance and practice and how particular meanings, identities and categories are reproduced and reinforced, even as musical participants are enabled to transform other aspects of their social worlds. With this notion, I also hope to contribute to developing an awareness in the field of community music of how active music making may not solely lead to social transformation, though this is definitely a possibility, but also how the same practice contribute to the reproduction, reinforcement and concealment of social constraints and how such processes may be simultaneous and intertwined. If the leading self-conception is founded on community music work as operating from the margins of the established social discourses. It becomes unclear how such activities themselves are entangled in authorized discourse and already established institutional formations that uphold the very inequality and constraints community music seeks to break with. I would also encourage you to read Mark Rimmer's chapter in the Oxford Handbook of Community Music 
where he writes of the problematic ways the category of youth is constructed in governmental policies and how community music initiatives targeting this group and aligning themselves with such policies in order to do so unconsciously may have the effect of reinforcing specific stereotypes of youth that ultimately set limits on the possibilities for their empowerment. So what Rimmer and my own work draw attention to are the subtle processes by which community music activities contribute to the constitution of frameworks that both provide participants with a range of opportunities for meaningful experience and action, and simultaneously are involved in the naturalization and reinforcement of categories and assumptions that may work contrary to the goal of empowerment and inclusion. The central argument is that for scholars and practitioners to come to fuller understandings of the consequences of community music work, awareness of these issues must be cultivated. Rather than imagining community music as an intervention from outside the boundaries of the established and dominant culture, the notion presented here presumes that such practices depend on, and thus in some sense also reproduce existing frames of legitimacy and authority. Therefore, a task for future research in community music would be to attend to the actions and experiences of the participants, observe and explore how social relations are established in musical practice, and critically investigate how these actions, experiences, and relations mediate and are mediated by wider social and institutional formations. I believe this approach would allow the complex and potentially contradictory workings of community music to come more fully into view. So thank you for your attention and I really look forward to engaging in conversation with you about these ideas both today and please feel free also to respond to me afterwards uh, through email. Um, thank you so much for, for your attention. Kim, thank you so much for that um, really uh, kind of packed presentation. Um, I'd love to have more of a conversation. I'm looking forward to those conversations that will come out today. Um, I think it would be great after you've given us so much to kind of, you know, um, reflect on there for us to move into some breakouts. Mm -hmm. I mean, intervention is is been a, the, the term intervention has been a hot topic for quite a long time. Mm. I, remember we, I remember the MUSOC um, meeting about a year or two ago down at York St. John, a year or two, that's where you have my time is. But um, we did a whole kind of exercise around the word intervention. And, you know, it's a bit like this dirty word sometimes, a bit like how education can be seen as a dirty word. With You know, people often say, don't worry, I'm not a teacher, when they rock up to a school as a community musician. And, and again, I think it has to do with what we mean by intervention. Um, is any form of change an intervention? Uh, you know, by the sheer turning up, it will change the dynamic because you're somebody coming in. So at what point does it, you know, I think it's a bit, it's a huge issue, Nicola, actually. I'm not yeah. necessarily unpick. Um, but there's a lot of... yeah. I'm just picking it. It was the main at the start of the presentation. It was uh, I was like, oh, there we, you know, it's that word again. It for me, it it, it relates to um, some some things that Matarasso says about planned and planned for, or you can't deliver, and you know we're not delivering something because we uh, because. Um, it's a live process, so we can't guarantee that we're going to have a, uh, or expect that there'll be a specific outcome unless we're intentionally, we've all agreed that and there's some, you know, we will learn X, Y, Z. Okay, that's specific. But in terms of what it means for people or something that's truly transformational as opposed to adding a bit of knowledge into a bank, which is more easily to, easy to me measure, 
we we can't we can't absolutely know can we and then there's something about so within that there's something about power as well isn't there i'm going mm. to do this intervention or we have decided to do this it, for me it, it brings up i'm not saying that it's a word we shouldn't use but it brings up um some of those issues around yeah who's making what decisions about what is going to happen and what people will experience mm. One of the uh, seminars that I was in earlier today around um, the research that Ryan is doing on terms in community music, transformation, empowerment and ownership, particularly the term transformation, we were very much looking at language and the deconstruction of language today. And it's very interesting that you mentioned that, particularly the term transformation, which I think was used quite a lot in uh, Kim's presentation. And if you're going into a context or situation with the intent of this keyword that's been used by a policymaker and the community musician is is in there trying to work with these words, I guess. Uh, transformation inherently is, is a movement, isn't it, from one place to another. So there's an assumption there that in order to transform where you're where you're at in the first instance isn't isn't where you should be so yeah. there's a movement to and from isn't there and it's like we're going in with the intent mm. to change so is that a positive or a negative it, sometimes it could be a positive sometimes it could also be a negative you have to check your own position and positionality don't you because that could be really problematic yeah. which is partly what he was what he talked about didn't he in terms of um he didn't quite say it like this but a plurality of what might happen in a in a encounter or space or however we want to describe that mm -hmm. activity the doing of activity that sense that there might be positive or other outcomes if we use that kind of evaluative language yeah. which is yeah well, it, I was going to say from what you said before, Bex, it, it just makes me think of um, how can an intervention exist if we don't know what the intervention is setting out to do? And it never will because the, the nature of community music is that it should be ambiguous. It should be open ended. It, you know, a good practitioner is going to be is going to be a responsive practitioner and they're not going to say I'm doing that regardless of whether the people I'm taking with me want to go there, you know, so how can we, you know, but then I get people who employ me to run projects with kids with very specific purpose and outcome. Mm. By the end of this project, we I mean, measure their social engagement, measure their confidence. I was also going to suggest actually uh, in terms of that positionality, but uh, the, the, where the call for change comes from, um, and so often, I think we'll touch upon again uh, within innovation. If it's, it's it's that thing about the top down, bottom up, isn't it? So the policy, if it's a policy that's dictating it, and that kind of that call for change is coming from above, as opposed to the community. If there's a call to change from the people, then as an intervention, I don't think that is problematic. But if it's a call for change from above, then that, that is a different question, but I think community music, um, particularly from a UK perspective, um, uh, a lot it always very much feels like in my position that what's the funding, how are we going to get the funding to continue what we're doing and what's the criteria and how are we going to match this and measure it? Um, and I don't know what your experience is. I know, Jess, you mentioned something similar. Well, but I also think I, I always... <laughs> probably shouldn't teach my students this, but I do. And, uh, and I say this to participants, I say, look, I'm hired by those people, but I work for you. <laughs> and, you know, this is what they think we're going to do. What do you want to do? And, you know, because that's what we have to do in a way. And but the thing is, I also have a set of limitations I have to work in because it's what I'm capable of. So the truth of the matter is that there are only two or three outcomes I know I can confidently support the delivery of. So while I'll offer options for the process, it's going to be one of the outcomes that I'm capable of within my skill set of enabling. And all of those are going to fit within the, the hirer's criteria enough. So it's this weird balancing act of giving 
agency and choice to participants, but within what I'm capable of enabling them to do. Otherwise, I'm screwed. And, and then, you know, if, I, if they want to deliver, if they want an opera project, you know, I can't really do that. And then I have to say, guys, I can't do that. You know, what else? Here's some options. But it's still agency within a framework. Mm. If that makes, and I think that's fine. If, you know, I'm a, I'm a human, I'm limited. We are limited as practitioners. We aren't. Um, but that the agency is the, the one word I wrote down because I didn't take very many notes uh, was agency, mm. um, um, which for me outweighs intervention um, and transformation. For me, agency or encompasses those words, perhaps. One walks away with a sense of agency. It's it's good. <laughs> it's like yeah, you know, you could call it empowerment, but I like the word agency even more. Something mm. about it. It's, yeah, it's it, it's of the that person as opposed to empowerment being something maybe yeah. for me anyway. Yeah, I yeah, that makes sense actually. The, the, what I found very interesting, and what I'm trying to to, to, to um, take in is the fact that through community music we can be breaking and transforming people, but we can also be, we may also be reproducing the stereotypes that are the issue, and that's what made me really, you know. Yeah, think. I thought that was really interesting as well. Yeah. So, is that something you have been um, approaching in your um, discussions at, in your class, the classes you're taking, and uh, is this a new idea for you, or is it something that you have uh, already thought about? Um, yes, the idea that um, when we're researching, we kind of go in with this kind of it's called a positivist approach that we're kind of going out or we're looking at like community music is good and we're kind of going mm -hmm. out to kind of prove that and yeah. the questions that we are asking we often know the answers to that's something that I I definitely thought about um after writing my dissertation because I look back on it and I'm just like yeah I already knew the answers I just went to kind of find data that was going to prove that I shouldn't that's probably not the approach yeah. that I should have taken well, it's natural that one builds from where one feels safe. And then, of course, you start challenging what you already perceive as the answer. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was thinking this reproducing forms of authority. How can one feel representing an authority or representing the person who is healthy or who is uh, positive when entering a, a community in which um, social issues have been setting people separately and how this can be left uh, when preparing for that uh, all of you and Elena who I will be seeing again and you know following her isn't that, uh, isn't that what Joe said about the favelas that people looked here in the eye and said that you're here to help us and to become one of us so I guess that this is a, m a main thing to consider for such thing as, you know, being an authority or being just the mm -hmm. person you want to be. Exactly. We, in class, uh, one of our the students taking the class, she has been working in uh, Argentinian favelas and she had to be auditioned before she was trusted. She was taken to a committee and she was again and again. They wanted to see that she was really into what they were interested in and that she was would be one of them before she was open, you know, she was accepted to even start. She went full of good ideas and positive ideas, but she was for a while stopped. And, you know, um, I think yeah, so would be... Oh, sorry. <laughs> I no, think that's no, the key, I... isn't it? To not go in with these preconceptions and these preconceived ideas. Brilliant. Um, so it would be great to um, to open up this conversation with any comments or any questions. You can share anything that you found interesting from your group discussions, if that's a nice way in. Um, for Kim, we've got a good chunk of time for this conversation. So Kim, I had a question to get us going, um, and I, we were just talking about it a little bit. Um, I really liked your articulation, your expression of docile agency. And I just wondered whether you could talk a little bit more about docile agency. I just thought that was really interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
Yeah, the notion of docile agency, I actually picked that up from um, an anthropologist called Saba Mahmoud, um, which, um, and she, she has done a fabulous study on, um, on an Egyptian mosque movement and some uh, women in this, in this uh, um, mosque movement that, that use Islam and use the religion to, to like navigate all these uh, norms and, and uh, values and, and structures that, that they're embedded in. And she discusses um, um, this idea of, of, of agency and, and docile agency. And, and the way I think about it is that, that uh, talking about social transformation, we have to talk about agency and how people are empowered to act and to to do something and to change their 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 social worlds in in, in some way but thinking of agency as as some kind of uh, docility or connected to this kind of facility you think about how um in order to act you you have to become subjected to some kind of legitimacy or some kind of authority that allow you to act in, in certain ways. So, so this kind of docile agency is really that kind of ambiguous or ambivalent uh, notion that, that I think is really helpful to, to, to think through when you think about uh, social transformation and, and, and music making and how, how that um, doing music activities may uh, help you to to transform certain aspects of uh, the social, but how that power to transform is actually embedded in uh, or, or is connected to you being subjected to some kind of authority or some kind of legitimacy that, that you pick up. Um, and I write about in my, in my research, I write about how some of the um, uh, Palestinian youth how they use the, the legitimacy and authority that they, they find in this nationalistic construct, that they find in this nationalistic di discourse that is very um, prominent in, in the Palestinian refugee camp. They use this legitimacy to, to gain agency in, in other aspects. For example, I, I write about some of the young women in, in the music program that uh, actually are not... Um, uh, in some ways that they are allowed to do music as they become 18, 19 years old, because they should actually be at home and prepare for marriage. But uh, they uh, sort of uh, defy these norms or they, they uh, exceed these, these norms by um, referring to the, the national aim of returning to Palestine as kind of their legitimacy for continuing in their engagement in the, in the music program. So they use the legitimacy of the national discourse to transcend some other norms they're also subjected to. And I see this as a kind of a, a docile agency that they subject themselves to some norms in order to transcend other norms and to carve out a space for, for meaning and for, for meaningful experience. So this is the kind of, of uh, this is how I think of this, this term, the docile agents. Thank you, Kim. That is just so fascinating, and I would love to talk more. Um, yeah, Nicola, I agree. What a, what a brilliant explanation, and uh, really interesting to hear that practical example from the Palestinians' um, woman's perspective that you discussed there. Um, oh, Carol has just put in the chat that um, they were discussing how in in our practice we are looking for ways to evidence transformation how we have to evidence this for our funding. So that kind of like evidencing of transformation, great. And we have a question from Rory actually. I um, don't know if you want to speak to either of these or both, Kim, about your conception of the idea um, that the community musician function as the kind of authority or, or as the legitimacy. Yeah. Um, yeah, I will try to respond to, to both. I think that that this is kind of um, this looking for evidence. This is exactly finding this kind of authority or legitimacy for for our work that that we need to do, uh, or that we feel like doing. And this is 
this is what we all have to, in some ways, find this, this uh, foundation of legitimacy and authority by which we can convince others to, to fund our work or to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to work with us in, in, in what we um, set out to do. Um, but I think generally, I think uh, talking about social transformation and, and music as leading to social transformation and finding that kind of evidence is extremely hard. Um, and I'm not sure actually whether one should pursue such a, such, such hard evidence of uh, of um, uh, music leading to social transformation, um, because when you start doing that, um, I think you are also like positioning your work in a in a specific frame where. If, if you cannot find the evidence, then the legitimacy of the work disappears somehow. Um, so you have to be extremely careful about how, how you set up these things or how you uh, talk to funders about uh, the legitimacy and authority of your work. Um, but I think one very important thing is to, 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 to think about the value of what you do for the participants and to, to center the legitimacy of your work in the in in the sense that it, it produces some value for for the participants that's really important um, and this idea of the community musician uh, functioning as kind of authority and legitimacy I think that is that is actually very interesting to think about how the the people involved in the program they themselves can, can become some kind of authority and provide the legitimacy. And I think we have seen in a lot of uh, like these kind of musical social work like community music or, or a better example would, would be El Sistema and, and that kind of work where you have these really um, uh, authorities uh, authoritative leaders also that really like gives the 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 whole uh, program a kind of yeah authority and and legitimacy because there are uh, great musicians or and and that can provide provide some legitimacy and authority for and and actually I think produce a possibilities for change because of the authority connected to that person. But of course, it's extremely vulnerable to place that kind of authority in, in, in one person. And that and we have seen lots of examples of abuse of power uh, because we like uh, take a person and, and really puts them in a place where they are the authority and they have the authority. And, and that's, that's really a vulnerable thing to do. So, so we have to be extremely careful about taking that kind of authority uh, on us as community musicians. But, but I think it's always there. Some, there's always this kind of, of power connected to, to that role as a facilitator. So you have to really use that in a careful way. Thank you, Kim. I can see you reading the chat there. So if you're happy to respond. Yeah, um, if not, I'll call out some of those ideas coming through. I think there was one from Nicola asking about the age of the teenage girls becoming women as being a common issue. Yeah, that's that's uh, around, I think, when they get like 17, 18 years old in, in that particular camp, that particular social environment, they begin to feel pressure from, from their families that they should do uh, stuff that is like, uh, like that you do when you are preparing for marriage and you're an honorable woman. So, so you have to uh, in, engage in engaging in singing and dancing would not be that kind of thing in, in this particular environment. So, so that's kind of difficult for the music program to, to keep the young women in the program when, when they become 16, 17 years old. Uh, so that's like a, a, a cultural, that's like, like a customs that, that, that influence the program. But it's really interesting to see how these young women uh, try to work around those boundaries and how they uh, how they find legitimacy for, for doing that by pointing to to uh, the national cause of uh, returning to Palestine. Yeah, I think this uh, this concept of, of liminality and in betweenness that that um, I got from Victor Turner uh, is really an 
uh, interesting and very like productive uh, idea and it's really it, it has influenced a whole field of, of scholarship in in what is called performance studies um, and and the theory of performance and what 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 it what it is to perform and to be a performer and what a performance space is and and, and what it can do and um, and it comes from this uh, ritual studies and and uh, and Victor Turner's ideas of of the anthropology of performance um, and I think that in in terms of of um, music theory and, and music education theory the work of Christopher Small even though he doesn't acknowledge uh, Victor Turner's ideas or he writes about um, how musicking, which is his, his term, how that is uh, uh, an event that establishes ideal relationships and how that allows for the participants to uh, explore and affirm and, and celebrate ideal relationships. And he's really, I think, very close to, to Turner's line of thinking in this, that, that the musical event establishes a space for exploring and affirming and transforming relationships. So, so that is kind of a, a space in between, a space where uh, you can uh, experience and explore social relations, but you can also transform them and you can work around them and you can uh, do stuff to them. Um, so, so I would really encourage, if you, if you want to, to like find a way of, of thinking about these things, uh, liminality and in betweenness. You could uh, definitely go to Christopher Small and, and his work on musicking and his idea of ideal relationships to get a to get a sense of how that that looks like in in music. Um, but I must say I'm also a bit critical about uh, Small's concepts, and I've written about that in the thesis and and some of my my publications uh, because I think it's too easily. Uh, Exactly this this kind of uh, social and, and institutional foundations that that underlie those musical practices that controls that space they disappear from you and and that I I have found uh, Pierre Bourdieu's thinking and Judith Butler's thinking really helpful for like retaining that kind of critical perspective on how uh, the ability to transform relationships is actually uh, founded on social norms and and. Uh, performativity, you know, the that the need to perform up to certain standards and, and stuff like that. So, uh, so there's really a lot of of interesting ideas in in that kind of um, theory. Kim, I, I could jump in with a question here. Thank you for your presentation. I thought it was great. I think it's a real uh, chat challenge um, to us and um, you know writing out there. So, I really appreciate appreciate that. Um, I something that caught my attention uh, that I'd like you to expand upon, if that was possible. And in, in some ways, it also is reflective of uh, uh, an MA discussion that we were having this morning. We had their master's class this this morning with some of the PhD students, and one of the things that we talked about uh, uh, kind of came through in your in your ideas. I'd like to whether you ex expand and I thought it was really interesting and that I think I'm right that you said that the that intervention that is often seen as outside but actually is already inside and I wondered if you could just talk a bit more about that about the fact that the intervention is not necessarily coming from the outside but it's already existent in the structure that that is. Yeah, um, yeah, that's, uh, thank you, Lee. Um, I think that we have a tendency, or at least I found that tendency within uh, my own way of thinking. And I think I see that reflected in, in much community music thinking that, that we are sort of um, uh, trying to respond to, to the people that we work with, the participants and their perspectives and their wishes and their, uh, whatever issues that they want to to work with, and then we have an idea of of uh, coming from the outside to intervene. It's like it's like the idea of intervention would be that you that you come from the outside and you intervene into something. Um, but but this, uh, I think it's important to problematize this idea of coming from the outside because 
in order to intervene, in order to actually have the legitimacy and authority to transform things, to change things, you have to have some kind of uh, authority to do that. You have to have some power to do that. And that, that power doesn't magically appear in, in the music making, or it, it, but, but you have to, to use some kind of um, uh, authorizing means or authorizing, um, um, what could you say? You have to have some kind of, um, uh, you have to have some power or some, some frameworks for, for, for doing uh, that intervention. And uh, I think, uh, for example, Mark, Mark Rimmer's work that I, that I talked about, um, how he uh, describes how community music initiatives that, that uh, targets youth as a specific group, in order to have that uh, power to intervene into a setting uh, and, and the power to intervene in, in, uh, for a group of youth, you have to align yourself with the policies and with the thinking about youth uh, that's not uh, just there, but that comes from the uh, institutionalized discourses and the social discourses surrounding that concept of youth. So you have to draw upon those sources of authority and legitimacy that are surrounding you and that is kind of also creating the very problems that you seek to intervene into. So this kind of, um, uh, what, what are we basing our interventions on? What, what are their uh, legitimacy and their authority? What, what are the sources of, of authority that we base our interventions upon? I think that's, that's really the crucial question. And often for, for getting funding and for, for doing anything, we have to align ourselves, ourselves with, with certain policies that are already uh, producing the problems that they seek to solve. Um, so, so that kind of uh, complex and, and paradoxical work, you have to find out way to, ways of, of some, sometimes transcending those or, or at least uh, working around those, uh, those constraints or those discourses that, that, that comes with that. But that's, that's pretty difficult to do and it's not, I don't know if you, if you can do it, but at least getting aware of, of the problematics surrounding that, that's really a first step, I believe. Yeah, and what you're speaking, what you're really highlighting here is that this work is difficult, it's messy, and you know, and you're not running away from the complexity. And that's what I think is exciting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I think that's really important that, that we acknowledge that it is messy. It is really messy work. And, and I think uh, my experiences from, from uh, being in Lebanon, working with the Palestinians, I really felt this, it is messy work um, because there's no uh, orderly way for me as a, a Danish uh, white uh, male to intervene in a good way in, in this kind of uh, environment, but uh, there's the, the, the other possibility would be not going there, not offering any resources, not, not doing anything. So you just have to accept that, that it is messy work and you should not uh, think about um, community music as some kind of uh, good work, always inclusive, always positive as, um, as uh, Dana Yerichuk has, has written about that we tend to think of communities always already inclusive. We have to acknowledge the, the problematics, the excluding features of community and, uh, and the ambivalent functions of the work we do. Kim, I could I ask you a question? Would that be okay? Certainly. Um, I'm, I'm kind of interested in, I'm interested in everything you're saying, it's great. Um, but I'm interested in if we can unpick, and I don't think we've ever done, I've never been in a forum where we've done it as a group of community musicians before. We're talking about authority and legitimacy, yeah, uh, for the community musician in situ, in context, yeah. And I'm wondering if we can have a look at what might be the things both within the, the community musician's own mind that gives them that, that they feel authorized, but also in the perceptions of the group where they're working with, what are the things that they think legitimize the intervention of the community musician. Mm. And, and my question, you know, to you is if we start to unpick those, do you think there's a hierarchy or 
different hierarchies depending on the context and what might those hierarchies possibly be mm. nice simple easy question of course <laughs> no i i think that would be, depend on the context really but, but i think it's really interesting and also interesting to think of these different perceptions of authority they may not be the same and they are probably not the same but still uh, we treat them as they are well, the same or not, we don't treat them at all. We, we, we see them as, as non-existent or, or don't even ask questions about where does the authority come from to intervene into this, this context. But I think um, those hierarchies that, that they are being constructed in every, in every setting and they would be different from, from context to context. And, um, and th it's really important, I think, to, to do those kind of uh, deep analysis of, of community music programs to kind of unravel some of those hierarchies that are being established, and I think that's that's really some of the some of the things that I've been really concerned with, trying to figure out what is the what is the social and political si significance of of community music in this particular context, and how does that create specific hierarchies of authority and legitimacy, um, and and how does that in turn uh, affect the, the participants and their way of engaging in the activities, talking about the activities, stuff like Are that. Are there examples that you've noticed from your work where, you know, leaving aside the institutional authority that you're given by being funded to do it and being put in place, that's fine. But other things where the, you, you think either this gives you your legitimacy or that you think that's been vested in you given to you by the participants from your own mm. from your own work yeah that's a good question i think those kind of um it's always kind of negotiating this this kind of uh, finding authority and and getting authority and um and in many ways i think when you are face to face with with participants you receive some kind of, you receive authority by by being there, by being uh, sympathetic to to their needs, and by trying to provide what whatever they wish, so so a, a good, successful community music facilitator would 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 be uh, receiving the authority from the participants themselves. But that's not the only kind of authority in play in 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 that kind of uh, in in community music context. So you also have to look at 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 broader uh, formations of authority surrounding your work. But I think we have had a tendency to, to look very much at the face-to-face -face relationships with the participants. And that's also, of course, a very, very important part of the work we do. But I think we have to pay more attention to the authorizing discourses surrounding our, our programs and surrounding the work we do. But that's always a, a negotiation, I think, between different instances of authority and different, uh, what, what Georgina Bourne would would uh, assign to different levels of sociality, which I think is a really uh, nice way to, to think about these, uh, this kind of different levels of the social that, and these kind of uh, authorizing discourses, and uh, they, they uh, are placed in, in different levels of sociality. So that's a way of thinking about that, I believe. Thank you so much for that. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jess was about to offer a question and has typed it in the chat. Um, Jess, as I think if you want to talk about that, you can. And then after that, we've got a question from George that relates back to the Palestinian women conversation we were having. But maybe Jess, I think yours connects in with Phil. So should we go? Well, to it, it kind of did. It kind of went back a, a step to what you were mentioning before, Kim. Um, I've made some notes, but I was actually just involved in what was happening. So I might have lost it a bit. But it was the thing about messy and how... A lot, I think a lot of the writing and a lot of the experiences a lot of us have had have been in, say, Western culture where, or in the UK, in my case, where there is a certain norm uh, uh, of kind of roles and it, it, because community music is far more embedded in this culture as a norm. Um, and the other isn't quite so extreme as it is in the kind of context that you're, you're, you experienced in Palestine. Mm -hmm. And I think, I, I actually don't remember what my question was now, um, but it was around the messiness of, of, of going into other cultures because there's another level of messy there, if you want to call it Definitely. that. Definitely, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, or at least it's it's more obvious, isn't it? When you go out and in, into yeah. another culture, everything is different. But I think if we pay close enough attention to the to the context we work with close to our homes and and our home cultures, I think we would we would also meet those kind of of um, this kind of messiness connected to different perceptions of of each other, different categories that we place each other in. Uh, different assumptions about what it means to be living in that neighborhood, uh, being that age, um, having that ethnic uh, background, stuff like that. So, so I think that 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 kind of, of messiness is is also um, is also uh, in in our home context. But it becomes really obvious, of course, when you go somewhere like uh, South Lebanon and working with with Palestinian uh, refugees. But uh, yeah, fortunately for me, that that kind of yeah uh, helped me to see some of the things that I but that I think can be transferred also to other contexts. That that kind of problems of of uh, how um, uh, yeah the, the messiness of, of community music work. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your comment. That's I really appreciate it. Yeah. And Kim, in the chat, George was asking for, I guess, a little bit more discussion around the example with the Palestinian um, women and teenagers, mm. and was asking about any potential dangers that could be posed for the participation in terms of the families, and the environment, um, and if so, how, how might you approach those situations? And I guess it's this question about do you intervene? So yeah, yeah. your take on it, because you were so clear with intervention, weren't you? You talked about it as um, being an event that um, interrupts and, and innovates, drawing on Lee Higgins' work, who's, who's gone from a barber. So maybe with that perspective, um, yeah. if you talk to that question, that'd be great. Yeah, that's that's really um, that's a good question. And, and it's, it's really difficult to, um, in this particular situation, uh, I and, and the other Scandinavian music educators, we're working closely with, with the Palestinian NGO and using their, their legitimacy in the social context to, to, to do our work and what we find to be important. But there's all sorts of clashes between um, what families of the camp think is, is appropriate for their, for their children and what we as, as a, um, music educators from the global north, uh, promoting cultural democracy, stuff like that, uh, think is appropriate or is important in, in the work we do. So there's all kind of, kinds, kinds of clashes here. And, um, and that sometimes produces some, some dangers or some, ha it, it, it has some consequences for the participants. And there are, there are participants that are, that are being, um, prohibited from from going to the program because of uh, the um, democratic way of, of uh, teaching that that the the Norwegians and I have, have imposed upon this this program, you know, because um, some of the there was a particular episode with a girl that that was prohibited from going to the program because her family found found her to be a bit like. Uh, uh, teenage-minded, uh, like uh, being in opposition to what, what they told her, and they thought that it's because of the music. Um, so she was prohibited from going to the program. So, so when you are in a situation like that, you always have to work with and around and against such social and cultural norms that that kind of sets limits to 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 what you can do. And you must try to. Uh, sometimes you intervene, and sometimes you have no means of, of intervening and you just have to say, well, what, what can we do about it? Um, but that's really a constant reflection that, that and, and a discussion that we have had um, in, the, in the music program, how to um, make everyone feel um, welcome and how to reach out to families or to more like conservative or traditional minded families that may not think that that music is actually a good thing for, for the children to be doing. Thank you so much. And we keep coming back to that, you know, ambiguity, that in-betweenness. Um, I can see you reading in the chat there. We're nearly coming to the end of our call. So before I ask you for final thoughts, I think it's worth um, if we touch on Imogen's question. Thank you, Imogen, and lovely to have you with us today. 
Um, Imogen's asked us a question about uh, research methodology. And I think in our last moments, it would be great to hear you talk about that because I know there's several people on the call in the midst of their research at the moment. So if you could talk a little bit about um, how your research methodology came into this and what might the addition of research component do to compound or transform structures of authority within community music yeah. settings. Thanks for that question, Imogen. And that might need to be our last one, unless somebody's really, really desperately got something to ask, you can give us a big wave. <laughs> Jim, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I wonder that myself, actually. I'm not sure I have an answer for that. Um, uh, I, my own research methodology was, was based on, on being there, participant observation, and, and interviewing these uh, both children from the program and, and facilitators and teachers and social workers and, and other children and youth from the camp to get kind of all of these different uh, perspectives on what was going on. Um, but I think it's really interesting to, to think about this, what, what might be the addition of a research com component um, to the do to compound or transform structures of authority within community music settings. I think there's there's a, a lot of work to be to be done in, in that uh, in in that area, and I think that um, a great way of of doing that would be to invite uh, participants to become kind of co researchers or to to involve them in in the uh, research design in some way. Uh, that's been really difficult for me to do in, in this particular program, also because uh, there's Lebanon is really far away and I was not able to be there as much as as uh, as I would have needed to be if if I wanted to involve um, participants in, in the research processes like this. But I think that would be great, uh, a great way of, of trying to to dis distribute this uh, authority to the to the participants and to make them aware of the uh, lines of authority and legitimacy that they're working within and, and try to to think of that uh, uh, to implement that in the design of the research that would be awesome um, but yeah that's uh, <laughs> that's for the uh, another PhD thesis I think. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kim, and thank you, everybody, for your um, contributions today. I feel like we've only really kind of scratched the surface of so many of those really rich ideas that you're presenting today, Kim. And um, as you've welcomed everybody by sharing your email address, then we can keep some conversations going. Um, we have recorded this event and it will be available on our ICCM YouTube channel which is a new channel with some content to come. Um, Kim, is there anything that you would like to um, uh, conclude with or, or say by way of wrap up? You don't have to, but there's a bit of a few minutes if you'd like to. I just uh, want to thank you all for, for listening to this and, and uh, engaging with, with these ideas. And I really hope that, that um, if you feel like that you will write me or, or keep discussing these ideas with me. That's been really uh, beneficial for, for me to, uh, to be here, to, to engage in this conversation with you. So thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Kim. And before, yeah, we, we'll, we'll, we'll do that round of applause now, actually. Well, you're right. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Kim. Really great to have you. And before you all leave, just to remind you that this was our fourth um, event in the uh, Criticality series, ICM, CCM Presents. There are some more events to come. Our next event um, is on November the 24th. Actually, I realise I haven't shared that exact link with Rory right now, so I might get that from the events calendar before you go um, and that is with an interdisciplinary team uh, led by Michael Bonshaw from Sheffield University looking at singing and well-being um, it would be great to see you there um, it's a large team Nicola Weidenbach who was on our ICCM conversations event that explored the impacts of COVID-19 on community music is also talking at this event for those of you that might want to see more of her work there's a load of links coming in the chat now you'll see the links to those upcoming events there thank you Rory I don't have to go searching you'll see that we still have a call for participation if um 
next term for our spring series if you would like to um, talk Phil this is our kind of gesture to, to not just offering some presenting if you want to kind of unmute and present for, for a time anyone on this call then you're welcome to send an idea in and there's more information there in the chat um, if you want information about things that are coming up Ryan's going to tell you about that now because I've talked a lot Hey, so yeah, so um, the ICCM has a few ways which you can keep up to date with our information. Um, you will see in the stuff that Rory's just sent across that we have our mailing list, which you can sign up to if you would like. We've also got our Facebook page, which I will share the link so you can find it on there. That's our ICCM Facebook page where we put all of our events. And we've also got a Twitter page as well, so you can engage with us via Twitter. And I've put that account there as well. Thank you, Joe. Great, thanks Ryan. So um, I think it will be until next time now. Lovely to see you all. Thank you for joining us from where you are. And can we just all unmute and give uh, Kim one final actual round of applause that he can hear. So, okay. <laughs> Thank you.